Hello. Oh, you know what? My mic isn't on. Probably a good idea to turn my mic on. Hello, hello? Hello, hello? 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 <laughs> How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will begin our discourse this morning, because we have a lot to get to. I'm sure uh, Willie B. left you with some good information to think about. And so we're going to think about this some more. Let's pray, and then uh, we'll go ahead and start. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you uh, for this time. Pray, Lord, that uh, this would be uh, instructive and encouraging, and that you would be glorified, Lord, as we seek to understand uh, this particular topic, and uh, we give you praise for it. Love you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this. I want to, uh, I'm just going to just go ahead and jump into it. We're going to look at some uh, uh, some definitions and some explanations. It's not on? Are you sure? Of course you're sure, because you wouldn't be telling me if you were There it is. Right. There it is. Now it's now now I can I can hear myself now. <laughs> uh, definitions and explanations of regarding worship. What I want to do is look at some contemporary and uh, kind of uh, um, um, past uh, definitions and explanations of worship, and then we're going to compare those definitions to the scriptures. OK, because uh, this is what we usually do. Uh, uh, usually when we talk about this particular, at least I know this is what I did um, in my studies and things like that. I would look at what everybody else was saying and I go, oh, yeah, I, 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 that kind of makes sense. I think I agree with that. And so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. <clears throat> this is one uh, from Neil W. Uh, Whaley. It's called The Way of Worship. Came out last year. They say this: This plan will cost us more than we ever thought we'd uh, uh, participate and fulfill us more than we ever dared dream. This plan is perfect in regarding worship. His plan for us to give ourselves on full life on a full life surrendered, serving, adoring. Worship is the very essence of why we are here. As the Westminster Catechism states, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So this is, according to these authors, this is the plan of God that we worship him. Okay? And they quote the Westminster Catechism. Um, Ken and Brow D um, uh, writes this. He says, our worship is not the slow song that the choir sings. Worship is not the amount you place in the offering basket. Worship is not volunteering in children's church. Yes, these may be acts or, or expressions of worship, but they do not define what true worship really is. There are numerous definitions of the word worship, yet one in particular encapsulates the priority we should give to worship as a spiritual discipline. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. That's um, Ken and Brow's view of what is true worship. I find it really interesting that he says that all the stuff that he mentioned before, he doesn't define as worship, but yet he goes, there are expressions of it. That's interesting. Let's look at uh, Durban C. He says, uh, biblical worship. He says, I say biblical because we're specifically talking about worship directed towards the triune God of the Bible. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can be defined this way. Biblical worship is a whole life response, head, heart, hands, to the greatness and goodness of God, right? So it's a, it's a whole life response according to uh, Durban's seat. Um, here's another uh, interesting um, uh, perspective here. This is from the uh, uh, Missouri Senate. Lutheran Church 
says this, the, and the common usage of the word worship is used to include this reception of the means of grace, hearing the scriptures and participating in the sacraments. <clears throat> However, in its sharpest focus, the word worship describes man's response to this power of God brought to his life by the spirit. Man's desiring to receive forgiveness, grace, and righteousness is worship. Gladly, the adverb that carries the worship accent into the action of hearing the word. It is not mere participation in holy baptism or the Lord's Supper that is worship, but the reaching out to God by the believer during this participation as he meditates on God's gift in the sacrament. So it's the intent, according to the church a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, it is the intent of what, what, what one's focus is when they are specifically doing these practices. That is uh, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and the Word, which they define as the means of grace. Let's look at, a, let's look at one more. It says, true worship is the celebration of being in a covenant fellowship with the sovereign, holy, triune God by means of the reverent adoration and spontaneous praise of God's nature and works, the express commitment of trust and obedient to the covenant responsibilities and the, and the memorial reenactment of entering into the covenant through ritual acts. So according to this individual, true worship is basically celebrating uh, 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 by his, his nature and works because we have a covenant relationship with God. Is this true? So let's take a look at the previous statements and then we'll jump into some, uh, some text here. Worship, as defined as the previous statements, is uh, to glorify God, as in the Westminster Catechism, right? Uh, the extravagant honor or extreme or complete submission, total submission to God, an extravagant honor. <clears throat> it is a whole life response to the greatness and goodness of God. Head, heart, hands, right? It's man's practice to the sacraments in the church and his intent. That was one. And then lastly, it is to celebrate the covenant relationship with God, acknowledging his nature and his work. Well, let's take a look at a couple of them. You guys have already ran through kind of a word study of this, but I think it's important to kind of do this uh, again in relation to these definitions. Let's take a look at the old economy and the church economy. Okay, uh, the old economy, the word is shaka, uh, which I get uh, you guys are very familiar with already. I'm I partake it. Let's look at a couple of verses, um, uh, that have the word shaka in them. Okay, one of them, uh, is Genesis 22 1 5. This is where God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice his son Isaac. It says, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place for God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw, the, and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over, and we will worship Shaka and return to you. This expression, Shaka is to bow, to prostrate, right? And then we see later on the expression of this intent of God, of Abraham taking Isaac laying him on the wood, and getting ready to slew his son. Uh, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1 through 5, gives us another, uh, another uh, place where this word is used. 
This is concerning uh, uh, God uh, appearing to the nation of Israel atop Mount Sinai. He says, then God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or under the water or under the earth. You shall not worship Shaka or serve them. I find this very interesting that, that these, these, these sayings that God gives to the nation of Israel are in sequential order. You shall have no other gods before me. Hey, you shouldn't even make a graven image of them. And hey, you shouldn't even worship them or serve them. You shouldn't acknowledge them. You shouldn't fall prostrate before them. It's interesting. He goes, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, Ganah, Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third in the fourth generations of those who hate me. It's interesting. You bow, you fall prostrate before a, a, an idol. In this context, you despise, you hate God because you don't acknowledge him fully. Interesting. Let's take a look at another one here. Psalm 81 verses 8 to 10 concerning Asaph. He says, hear all my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you, if you would listen to me. There will be no strange God among you, nor shall you, Shaka, worship any foreign God. Again, this goes back and relates right back to Exodus 20. For I, the Lord, or I, the Lord, am your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Again, Asaph. Detailing, recalling the promises of God. And the fact that God, he is who he says he is. The one who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. No false God has done this. And he is the one that the nation of Israel should shaka, worship, bow down to. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 12 says, there are certain Jews who you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon. This is after uh, Israel is placed into captivity by the Babylonians. Namely, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship. Shaka, the golden image which you have set up. I find this interesting that oftentimes we see the word worship and service in the same space. Why? Because these particular gods have certain uh, behavioral, uh, uh, have a certain ethic, a certain behavior by which you can worship them, you can acknowledge them, right? So we have the, in the old economy, there's the word shaka. What about in the new economy? What about the church economy? This word is proskuneo. Again, you guys are very familiar with this as uh, uh, Willie B went through a word study this morning, right? Proskuneo. It carries with it the same connotation as shaka, to bow, actually to, 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 to fall forward or fall towards. What is this? Let's look at a couple verses here. Matthew 2, verse 2. This is concerning the birth of Christ. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. This is concerning the temptation of Christ in the wilderness okay? by, to be, uh, by the devil. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and proskuneo, prostrate yourself before me. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Lots of hubris going on there. I wish I had time to, to parse this out. This is kind of cool. But essentially, uh, uh, Christ himself is being, is being told by the devil, hey, look, um, you could get all of this. Um, you, all you got to do is just acknowledge that uh, I'm the greatest. And I'll give this all to you. John chapter 4, verses 20 to 23. Fascinating text. Uh, this is Jesus talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. She goes, our fathers worshipped on this, in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. So in the context of the woman at the well, he says that an hour is coming and now is. Why does he say that? Well, he says it because he's the one that's been sent by the Father. That's why. She's looking right at him. To acknowledge Jesus, uh, according to this text, is to acknowledge and worship the fall prostrate before the Father in spirit and in truth. Interesting. Just a note here, um, when it comes to the word proskuneo, to fall forward or fall towards, this word cannot be found in the epistles in the New Testament as it relates to the conduct or response of the church. It is used twice in the epistles. It's used in uh, Hebrews 1 to refer to the angels. And it's used in 1 Corinthians 14 to refer to a pagan who uh, is seeing the manifestation of the Spirit, these, these abilities that God has given uh, for the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And the pagan goes, oh my gosh, God is truly among you and prostrates himself. Okay? But in terms of the church, the conduct, the response of the church itself, and how we are to uh, be in position before God, it is not there. It is absent. Paul does not command that the uh, saints proskuneo before God. John does not uh, 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 command that the, that the saints, the body of Christ, should proskuneo before God. It's not there. However, this particular word returns in the book of Revelation. Twelve times this word is used, and I may add this, that this word is not found in any of the letters to the seven churches either. It's found from chapter 4 on, but, but never in the letter to the seven churches. And, and you could tell this so far because we've been uh, observing this with a fine tooth comb, right? So let's, some things to note about Shaka and Proskuneo. Okay, let's take a look at some observations here. One, these words appear to be associated with objects, images, locations or appearances, okay? Shaka and proskuneo, they appear to be associated with those things, okay? 
Two, these words appear to be associated with instruction or doctrine. Again, we, we see that worship and serve are often in the same space, right? that there is an instruction that one must follow to acknowledge this deity, okay? To acknowledge either God himself or a false deity, okay? These words communicate how one is to observe God or even a false deity, as I mentioned before, that, that, that when one, uh, shaka or proskuneo, we see that, that, that they, they conduct themselves in a manner that reflects the God whom they serve, right? As in the case with Israel, given the, the law and how they were supposed to observe that and keep that, as well as other false deities in the case of Molech, right? Offering your, offering your kids uh, to the flames of Molech. This word has everything to do with acknowledgement or honor. This also means the nature and the instruction that they teach, right? When you do these things, you essentially are proskaneoing or shakaing. That's not, those aren't real words, right? But you're essentially doing that. Again, I find this to be very fascinating. Hmm. So it would appear that these particular words concern, are concerned with the acknowledgement of a deity, his instruction, his ways, and acts involving the lesser to the greater. The greater demands or, 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 or commands that you do something and that doing something honors him, okay, and glorifies him. Now, again, I mentioned before that the word proskuneo in the church economy is not used concerning the, our conduct, the way we are to conduct ourselves. It's not used. There's no command uh, by any of the apostles of Scripture where this word is used concerning the, 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 the church, the body of Christ. So let's take a look at the word service. Let's take a look at the old economy. Here we have the word abad. Okay. Let's take a look at this word abad. This word abad is translated service. Sometimes it's translated work or labor. Okay. We'll see this in, Re in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5. We find this word first used here. It says, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate, to work the ground. There was no man yet, right? And so Moses is, is detailing this to us um, concerning uh, the labor that was supposed to take place in the garden, and there was no man to do that just yet, to till the, to till the ground. Exodus 4, verse 23. Now, what I find interesting is, is this word is abad, but yet the translators translate this as worship. And he said, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. This word is abad. Fascinating how it's translated like this. Exodus 34, chapter 34, verse 21. God concerning the nation of Israel, giving him his sayings. And he says, you shall work abad six days. But on the seventh day, you shall rest, even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. Interesting. Let's keep going here. Numbers chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, concerning the uh, priestly duties. 
says they, that is the Levites, shall perform the duties for him and for the whole congregation before the tent of meeting to do the service of the tabernacle. They shall also keep all the furnishings of the tent of meeting along with the duties of the sons of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. The Levites were charged with completing all of the work and the service that God had delineated and outlined in his word to them. Since they were a personal uh, possession of God set apart to do this work, he is telling them that they are to do that. So those are some of the examples of how this word is used in the old economy. But what about the church economy? How is this, what, what word is, a, is, is synonymous with the word abad? Well, uh, the word is latreia. Let's look at a couple of instances regarding this particular word. Romans chapter 9, verse 4. So as far I wish, uh, this is uh, Paul writing to uh, the saints of Rome concerning Israel. It says, for I wish or I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated for Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption of sons, the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service and the promises. Paul outlining all of these things uh, that by the mercy of God has been given to Israel. And one of them he outlines is the service. The Latria. Romans 12, 1. You know, I have a, uh, a bone to pick with most translators here. We usually read the term uh, reasonable or spiritual service of worship. This word, Latria, is not translated worship. This is an interpretive thing by the translators. It's termed service. And we see this in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what it should be translated as. We will come back to this later. We'll come back to this verse later. Hebrews 9.1, concerning uh, uh, the, 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 the first covenant and the regulations and divine service and the earthly sanctuary, talking about the practice of the priests, uses this word, the divine service, Sometimes this word is translated worship. I, I have a problem with that, to be honest with you. Because that's not used there in the Old Testament, what we just saw. And then lastly, Hebrews 9, 6. And when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the service. Again, they are doing things, right? The priests are. They're not just sitting there with their, you know, with their hands up all day. They are doing stuff, performing duties that God has delineated in his word. So let's look at Abad and Latria just for a second. Some things to note. One, these words appear to be connected with labor especially Avad, okay? Especially that word. It is, it is connected with labor or conduct of some sort, okay? This word uses, uh, this word God uses to discuss the labor of the temple activity in the Old Testament as well as general activity as well as we saw in, uh, in Genesis 2, Okay? This word in terms of acts in the temple of the Old Testament was associated with the Levites. They were to avad in the temple, do these works, these service in the temple for God and for the nation of Israel. And lastly, this word Paul uses to discuss the reality of the person in 
Christ. They are to give their bodies to reasonable service. Let's go back to Romans 12, verse 1, for just a second. And therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This word is used of the church. Okay, as a matter of fact, we see plea, a plea from Paul to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. And this is our reasonable service. Sometimes this word is translated spiritual in some translations, but it's our, it's our reasonable service. Why would Paul use this? Why would Paul use this word and not proskuneo? Well, I think we need to take a look at some of the words in this verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Let's take a look at a couple of words here. So let's take a look at your bodies and sacrifice. Interesting. Paul pleads with the saints of Rome to present their bodies, fingers, head, shoulders, knees, toes, that, that sort of thing. Our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. This is fascinating. The word sacrifice is thysia. This word is used 29 times in the New Testament. Okay. Well, let's take a look here. This word is connected to the type of sacrifices or offerings to present to God. Okay. If you wanted to actually translate this word as offering, you could do that too. Okay. Let's take a look. Leviticus chapter 6. We're going to look at some Old Testament verses here. Leviticus chapter 6. Verses 14 and 15. As a matter of fact, we're going to stay all throughout Leviticus here. Because this word is used often. It's, it's synonym in the Hebrew. Romans chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. Now, this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall present it before the Lord in front of the altar. Then one of them shall lift up from, from it a handful of fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and its incense that is on the grain offering, and, they, and, they, and he shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as a soothing aroma, as a memorial offering to the Lord. You notice this word is used several times, right? That they were to take fine flour and oil and, and, and present it before the Lord as a grain offering. Okay? Leviticus chapter 14. Verses 10 to 13. This is concerning the cleansing of a person with leprosy. <clears throat> now on the eighth day, he is to take two male lambs without defect and a, ye and a yearling ewe lamb without defect, and three-tenths of an epath of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, and one log of oil. And the priest who pronounces him clean shall present to the man to be cleansed, and the aforesaid, um, and, and the aforesaid before, the, before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Then the priest shall take one of the, one of the male, one male lamb, and bring it for a guilt offering, with the log of oil and present it as a wave offering before the Lord. Next, he shall slaughter the male lamb in the place where they slaughter the sin offering and the burnt offering at the place of sanctuary for the guilt offering. Like the sin offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. Again, we see this word used here, right? This, uh, this term offering. It's something that, that is being presented to God. 
Leviticus 21, verse 22. 21 verses 21 to 22. It says, no man among the descendants of Aaron, the priest who has a defect, is to come near to offer the Lord's offerings by fire. Since he has a defect, he shall not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the food of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy, right? So he can eat the food, he just can't present it. Why? Because he may have a defect, right? Again, I find this interesting. Matter of fact, let's read a couple more verses here. Only he shall not go out into the veil or come near to the altar because he has a defect, so that he will not profane my sanctuaries. For I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Fascinating. Leviticus 23, verses 18 to 20. It says, along with the bread, you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect and a bull of the herd of two rams. They are to be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering of fire and a soothing aroma to the Lord. You shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs one year for the one year old for, the, for a sacrifice of peace offerings. Then the priest shall wave them with the bread, the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priests. Do you notice a pattern here regarding these, uh, these sacrifices? All of these sacrifices that are mentioned and many others in the book of Leviticus and elsewhere in scripture, all of these scriptures have with them the quality of being without defect. Dr. Smith, where are you going? I'm going to tie all of it together. Trust me. You couldn't offer a lamb with a defect. You, if you were a priest and you had a defect, you couldn't go in, right? You could eat of the stuff. You can eat of the most holy things, but you could not go in. Here's the punchline, folks. You ready for this? Oh, this is, whew. here we go. Old Testament. The animals without blemish are acceptable in the sight of God, correct? We just read this, right? That in order for you to present something before the sight of God, it had to be without blemish, right? Without defect. New Testament. Jesus is, the, is acceptable in the sight of God and it is a sacrifice without spot or blemish. You remember what John, right? John the Baptist said, right? When he comes to see Jesus, that is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The requirement of a sacrifice has to be without blemish, right? What about the epistle to the Romans? Oh, oh, this is so good. I'm gonna have a cup of coffee and let this linger here for a minute because I know it's coming. When it comes to the saint, the one who identifies with Christ by way of the gospel, one is seen before Christ without blemish and acceptable in the sight of God by identifying with Jesus Christ. This is why Paul uses the word latreia, service, that we are to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice because we've been made without spot or blemish already. This is huge. Now, 
Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. It is, it is, it is implied, it is assumed in the text that you cannot be a sacrifice if you are blemished. You cannot. You can't do this. Okay. And it is God that has done this. We are made acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. What is the service? What is the service? that we are to do. What is the service? Well, Paul, in his letter, his epistle to the Romans, doesn't have them guess what this is. He tells them in, the, in chapters 12 to 15, how do you give, how do you present your bodies? How do you offer your bodies as ex already acceptable to God? For reasonable service, he outlines it in the last three chapters, the last four chapters. 12 to 15, 16 is, you know, acknowledgments and things like that. But how we are to prostrate ourselves before governing authorities, how we're to treat one another, how we're to, to, to use our abilities uh, 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 for, for one another how we're to care for each other, how we're to think about one another intentionally, that's the service. Because we have been made acceptable to God by his mercies. So let's look at this defined by the previous statements. How about this, to glorify God? Well, I, I can get behind that. I can get behind that. The problem is, is that it's from a catechism, not from Scripture. We know the verse that, that we can look at, Roman, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. But the problem is, is that it points to the catechism. I'm sorry, but the catechism isn't inspired, <laughs> Right? How about extravagant honor or extreme or complete submission? Do you know what that means? How do you know that you've submitted yourself completely? How do you know that? What standard do you use? And notice that none of the verses that we looked at, none of the definition or descriptions that we looked at have anything to do with this. Honor is associated with service, no doubt. But extravagant honor? How do I know that I'm honoring extravagantly? How do I know that? It is a whole life response to the greatness and goodness of God. What does that mean exactly? As opposed to a partial life. Again, I can get behind the intent. Recognizing the greatness and goodness of God, I get that. But what does a whole life response mean? What does that mean? What standard do I use to determine if I'm doing it whole life or not? It's never stated. Man's practice in response to the sacraments of the church. You know, I find this um, interesting. There's no scripture that points to a location, ordinance, music, or ordinance of the church to complete, to worship God. There's none of that there. This is the reason why proskuneo is not used. Why is it not used? Because Christ isn't physically here yet. There, we don't, we are, we're not going to Jerusalem every year. We're not doing that. There's no particular music that underscores more worship than others. As a matter of fact, we mostly define worship on whether or not it makes us feel a certain way. To celebrate the covenant relationship with God. This is interesting. I might get some pushback from that, but this is okay. There's no covenant one can point to that the church operates under. This also makes the case there's no worship involved either. We see this in the new covenant as well. In fact, the sin that he will remember no more concerning Israel is their idol worship. 
the very reason why God scattered Israel in the first place. The church operates under no such ordinance, which is why we don't find proskuneo in as it relates to the church in the script as in the scriptures, in the epistles. So to sum up, and I finished. See? To sum up, biblical worship in the Old Testament, Gospels, and Revelation is intimately connected to a person, object, or location. I don't have any problems with a person going, hey, uh, you know, I, I want to worship God with my life. Okay, I, I, can, I can get behind that because the intent, the focus is to, is to, is, is reasonable service. I have no problems with that. But if somebody were to call, I'm going to go to the house of worship. Really? I have a problem with that. Because technically in the scriptures, the house of worship, this is not. I just spoke like Yoda. Two, worship is not mentioned in the epistles. That is proskuneo in terms of the church because Jerusalem is not the focus and Jesus is not physically present. It will be as Revelation underscores when we get to that uh, in the next eon or so. Okay? But Jesus is before the Father, interceding for the saints. He's not physically here. We don't, we don't have Jesus to bow to physically. Okay? Worship is not the reality in this specific economy because we have been made acceptable in the sight of God in Christ. Again, we've been made acceptable. Usually people use worship to determine how faithful they are to God. That's, that's, that's not good. Or how deep they're getting with Christ. We've been given all things beyond measure. Now, we can grow in our knowledge of the Lord. That's true. But to say that we're getting deeper to God by worshiping him, lifting up our hands and praying, that, that, that's nowhere in Scripture. That's foreign to the text. And the believer's service is found in their conduct and their intent, right? To glorify God is our intent and to do it by the, by the works of service and serving and loving our neighbor. Yes, yes, that, that, that is good. Not proskuneo, but service. On that note, yes, glory to God alone. Let's pray. Lord, this is a this is a child, this is a challenging topic. Um it's a challenging topic, Lord. It's not necessarily controversial, but it is challenging, Lord, because we seek to understand who you are. And sometimes the things that we do and the things that we say get in the way. Lord, I pray and I, I thank you so much, Lord, that you've made things very clear to us, Lord, that really where the action is, is where we are serving um, amongst uh, one another for your glory. We thank you so much, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you teaching us from uh, 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 your word, and that we would uh, fo shift our focus a little bit, that it's not about singing, it's not about where we go, but it's about, uh, but it's about the service that we have uh, that we are to do because we've been made acceptable in the beloved by your son. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise, for it's in your son's name. Amen.